Hey, what's going on, everybody? Apostle Zach Nielsen here. And as always, if you're watching the replay, feel free to fast forward a few minutes. I'd like to give the live audience a chance to tune in. Don't mind the silence. I'm not fantastic at small talk. Let me know where you guys are watching from. Let me know if it's your first time tuning in. Please feel free to share this. I've been wanting to get on here for a couple of days now. In regards to the election, and it is about the election and the prophetic words but it's also deeper than that as well. Um, man, I got there's a lot of Christians out there with doubt problems, and you can call it whatever you want to. You can paint it whatever color. You can paint that pig whatever color you want to paint it. It's still a pig. And um, we're going to talk about that for a little bit. We're going to talk about prophetic words, respecting the prophet. It's amazing to me how literally on election day, because the president didn't win decisively on election day, that every Christian, or not every Christian, but many Christians on Facebook are immediately picking up stones and throwing stones at the prophet's and the leaders in the church that prophesied a Trump victory. I mean, they didn't even give it a second. I mean, as soon as it started looking like it was swinging or something was up, they went straight and they went and picked up the biggest stone they could find and they started stoning the prophets. All things considered, it's really not wise. And I'm going to give you some scriptures to uh, validate that response. But we have got to learn how to endure. It's like just because Trump didn't win by a decisive landslide on election day, the prophets are wrong and we're going to condemn them. Well, that is so inaccurate, it's not even funny. You know, I think that, you know, God is always doing more things than just one thing. Okay, all of his, he's multifaceted. You know, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, you know. He's doing countless things right that we can't even see with this election he he he's he's working on the president's heart he he's exposing wickedness in the government he's building the the believers up to endure for crying out loud nobody knows how to endure anything anymore it's like everything has to be microwaved everything has to be done right now right now right now and i got news for you read the word very rarely is I don't think I've ever really, I mean, aside from like healing miracles that happened instantaneously, there was a lot of people that had to wait a long time for prophetic words to come to pass. They had to endure hell on earth, uh, poor treatment, abuse, starvation, all kinds of stuff. You don't believe me, just go read the Old Testament, okay? Just read the New Testament. It's all in here, okay? But I'm telling you, as soon as, oh, well, you know, I guess all these prophets are full of, full of crap no they're not because i too had a dream i know what i saw it wasn't a huge elaborate dream but i know what i saw and i saw president trump and and uh, and my spirit just felt you know like he was gonna win and so the thing that i've tried to tell people i, I was watching sid roth and he had somebody on i forget who it was and um I think it was uh, Mark Muro or, or something like that. I, I don't know. I probably did not pronounce his name right. You probably know who I'm talking about, Mario or something like that. Anyways, um, he was talking to him, and he said, you know, if Trump had won by a landslide, we wouldn't have any reason right now 
to to investigate any wickedness, anything deep hidden in the underbelly of our government, right? Because if he won by a landslide, everybody would have went straight to celebrating, clapping their hands, and, and we would have moved on to, you know, the second term of the president. And so that didn't happen. Why? Because I believe God has something deeper that he's doing. The Lord is trying to expose a deeply hidden wickedness in our government system, in our, in our government structure, you know, all the way down to local government. He's trying to expose something, and he can't do that if he would have just handed Trump a victory, handed us a victory in America, okay? But because that didn't happen that way, everybody who prophesied that, that Trump was going to win was a liar. And I, I see Christian leaders, I see believers, I see everybody, you know, on Facebook saying, oh, all these people need to apologize, blah, blah, blah. Listen, the election is not over. I, the news does not have the authority to call an election. I don't care if they call him the president-elect or not. Neither one of them has won anything yet. Either way, there has to be, they're investigating stuff right now. They're holding a press conference right now. Um, I had to miss it because I had to do this video now, but I know that they're doing a press conference at the moment. But I have some, some scripture that I want to read because one of my pet peeves in the Christian body is everybody's a false prophet. The, you know, everybody is not a false prophet. The Bible is very clear on what false prophets are. Now, there can be prophets that miss it. There can be prophets with poor character, but but false prophets in the Bible and prof and false prophets on social media are two completely different things. You know, I get sick of people say, Oh, Joel Osteen's a false prophet. Last time I checked, Joel Osteen's not even a prophet. He's a pastor, first of all. So that's the first error. And second of all, when has Joel Osteen prophesied about anything that didn't come to pass? Okay. Even if you argue, argue that he's a false teacher, right? Just because you don't like somebody's ministry does not make them a false minister of God. So, and that's an absolute truth, whether people like it or not. There's people that I don't care for, but I'm not going to call them false. And I'm going to get into some scripture that's going to validate why we shouldn't just be calling people false. We need to be careful with our words, folks. We need life and death rest on our tongue. Okay. Proverbs 18, 21, the Lord has anointed our mouths to produce life or curse and bring death. And many times believers are, are speaking death over the will of God and speaking life over the will of the sa over the will of our flesh and Satan. So like we need to like seriously, James says, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Instead of rushing and saying, Oh, this is a false prophet, you know, people like Jeremiah Johnson, Tracy Cook, uh, Lance Wellnow, uh, you know, there's Countless. I mean, you can't have a hundred people. A hundred people. And I'm just talking about big names in the prophetic ministry. I'm not talking about your local ministers that are saying the same stuff, your local believers that are saying the, that are seeing the same stuff. I'm talking about the big names that on a national scale are known prophetically for their accuracy. Kim Clement, all those people. You know, so when all those people are saying the same thing, right? And there's no discord, there's no disagreements. You're not going to sit here and tell me that they're wrong. There's too many voices. The Lord is doing something right now in our government and exposing a very deep hidden cancer, a deep hidden weakness in our government, a sickness in our government that he's trying to heal. So that's why things are playing out the way they do. You think it's coincident that, that, we just so happen to have enough uh, Republicans in Congress to, to get a Supreme Court justice for, for Trump to pack, for, not to pack, but for Trump to get all these uh, pro-life, pro-word of God, Supreme Court justices in. It's not coincidental. The Lord is setting this all up. So people need to slow down with the accusations that, that everybody like is a false prophet. It's a bunch of nonsense. It's nonsense. Second Chronicles 20, 20. They arose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, old Judah, 
and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in the prophets, his prophets, and you will succeed. Now, right now, there are many believers that do trust the words of the prophets. I'm one of them. I 100% trust what Jeremiah Johnson said. I followed his ministry for years. I trust him. I, as Jesus says, you know them by their fruit. Well, I've watched his fruit, and I would eat off of his tree any day of the week. I trust his fruit. I trust people like him. So we have to stop slandering the prophets, which is ignorant anyways, because you're slandering an anointed one of God. If it says in First Chronicles 16, 22, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. No harm. It's not just talking about physical harm. It's talking about don't be slandering. Don't be speaking death. Don't be gossiping. Don't be uh, accusing them of anything. That word harm there is a uh, raw in Greek, and it means to break, to shatter, you know, as in one's reputation. Okay? And, and Deuteronomy 18.22, this is, this is what it says about prophets. I want you to listen closely now. It says in Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that thing in which the Lord, that is a thing in which the Lord has not spoken. So if it does not come to pass, then it was not from God. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, and you shall not revere him or uh, be afraid of him. Okay? The election has not been called. It's not over. I don't know if you remember when Al Gore was elected in 2000, but he was elected, the, the president-elect, for like 30-plus days. They had newspapers printed out, President Gore, okay? So just because the media is calling something does not mean that's what it is. You need to get back in the Word of God. You need to get back with what the prophets are saying. You need to stand in agreement why are all these people congratulating Joe Biden? Are you kidding me right now? That is not what the prophets said to do. Joe Biden doesn't stand for anything that's in here. Nothing. Why are Christians celebrating a president who stands for full-term abortions, who stands for same-sex marriage, same-sex rights, who, who says it's okay, that an eight-year-old boy can, can have his uh, gender switched at eight years old, but yet you can't buy cigarettes until you're 18. You can't vote until you're 18. You can't own a gun until you're 21. Those things are not permanent changes to your body, but you can have your body mutilated at 18 years old, and the government will pay for it. This is the kind of wickedness Christians voted for when they voted for Biden. I don't care how much you read your Bible. You voted for something that God hates, and you will be held accountable for it. So it's best if you did. I'm not going to condemn you. The Word condemns you. The Word condemns you. I'm just reading what the text says here. Now, I'm not going to go on a rant or anything like that because I want to stay on here. But if you voted, hey, repent. Repent. The blood of Jesus will cover it, and you'll be washed white as snow. Why does snow? Hey, people get deceived all the time. Just repent for it, get right with God, and, and get in the Word. That's all there is. But it says, if that thing does not come, come to pass, that's Deuteronomy 18.22, if it does not come to pass, if the prophetic utterance, if the prophetic word does not come to pass, then the Lord has not spoken. And that prophet spoke presumptuously. Okay? I'm telling you right now that the prophetic words haven't had a chance to come to pass because the election is not over. So we got to chill out with saying things. And I'm not just talking about presidential elections. People get discouraged all the time because someone's, hey, I, I, I know firsthand how frustrating it is when prophetic words don't come to pass. But generally, there's two to three reasons why prophetic words don't come to pass in our personal lives. I'm not talking about the election. I'm talking about our personal lives because there's a lot of people that have been spoken over, myself included, okay? Either one, it wasn't from God, 
and it was spoken from a from uh flesh okay two and this is more often not the reason two is because we aren't obeying okay Pro- a lot many prophetic words spoken from prophets or prophetic people are conditional upon our obedience so if we're not doing what the lord's requiring us to do if we're not course correcting if we're not making adjustments if we're in our lives, if we're not doing what, we're, what, what God wants us to do, then those prophetic words are not going to come to pass. So it's not the prophet's fault. It's our fault. So either it was entirely a flesh word and the prophet is not a prophet and they were just blowing smoke or we were disobedient and the word did not come to pass. Or it was not released in the right time and season. It could have been released too early. It could have been released too late. And, and the prophet just messed up and missed it. And guess what? It happens. It happens. But it doesn't tell us in the New Testament to stone people. Even if a prophet misses the mark, it says it doesn't say anywhere to stone them. Okay? And we're going to get to that in a minute. But it doesn't say anywhere that our first reaction should be to stone the prophet. Oh, it didn't come to pass right on time. So... Let, let's massacre him. Let's crucify him. Doesn't that sound like what it says? Doesn't that sound, when, when they go to crucify Jesus, they're like, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. How does the church sound right now with all these prophets? You know, tell them, tell them, don't, telling them to repent? Are you kidding me? Telling these prophets that are, Above reproach, that these prophets I know firsthand bear a lot. They live the they live the life of a holy person. Okay, you know I'm not saying nobody's perfect, but I know that these prophets are the real deal. First Chronicles sixteen twenty two. Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. There's a good example of this in Numbers chapter 12. Then Miriam and and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman in whom Moses married. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. And now the man, Moses, was very humble, more humble than any other man on the face of the earth. What does God do to humble people? He exalts them. If it says that Moses is the most humble man on the earth, then I can tell you right now he's not a false prophet. But they were insinuating that Moses couldn't hear from God very good anymore, and they were insinuating that they could also hear from God. And that's where we're at, too. There's everyday believers that aren't walking in destiny, okay? They're lukewarm. They're living half in sin. And they're going to call these prophets of God out. They're going to call these prophets of God out as if these prophets are lying. Who are you to call them out? Take the plank out of your own eye. The Lord, I mean, go and read Numbers chapter 12, but it goes on to say that that Miriam and Aaron Miriam was uh, struck with leprosy by God because he was so mad that they chose that they spoke against Moses, that they spoke against his anointed servant, his anointed leader. The Lord chose him. And when Miriam and Aaron spoke against his anointed one, he struck Miriam with the worst kind of leprosy. She was almost dead. This is Numbers 12. Go read it. It's all there. So when he says in 1 Chronicles 16, 22, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm, he means serious business right here. We have to stop speaking against leaders. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to agree with me. But it would be very wise for you from a biblical point of view, okay? If you live according to the word of God, it would be very wise for you to be slow to speak and quick to hear. Slow to speak and quick to hear. First Peter 2, 1 through 3, Therefore putting aside all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, which is another word for gossiping. Okay, that gossiping, right? Like newborn babies long for pure milk of the word, 
so that by it you may grow to respect salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, there are six things which the Lord hates. Hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, and feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. A lot of people may have good intentions. I dare say that the Pharisees in their eyes thought what they were doing was right. Nobody ever, well, I'm not going to say nobody, because I know there is a, there is a kind of evil out there that, you know, we don't think is real because it's so wicked. But most of the time, most villains don't see themselves as the villains. They don't. They think that what they're doing is right. Apostle Paul said, you know, when, when Apostle Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul, and Saul thought what he was doing was right to kill Christians and persecute Christians. He thought he was serving the Lord. So the Pharisees, I can't imagine them thinking what they were doing was evil and still doing it. They were deeply deceived. They were deceived by pride and anger and all kinds of things. But I, they, I don't believe that they thought what they were doing was evil. They were just really deceived. So we need to watch. We need to watch that in our own lives. Because our deception is going to cause us to speak against leaders in the ministry, against prophets, against apostles, against pastors. It's going to cause us to speak against people. Okay, And the Lord hates a gossip. Anyone who spreads strife among brothers, if you're going and you're talking to people on Facebook or you're talking to people at your church and you're doing this about who's a prophet and who's not a prophet, listen, you need to have some reverency, okay? You need to have respect. You don't have to like a person, but you need to respect the office in which God called them. You need to respect the anointing. That's why David did not kill Saul. David was justified to kill Saul. Saul had made attempts on his life. So really, David could have acted in self-defense. And when Saul was relieving himself in the cave, David went up and cut his robe off, and he even felt guilty about that. Why? Because King David respected the anointing that God placed on Saul and the fact that God himself made Saul the king, and it was not David's position to take that away from Saul. That was God's duty, not David's. So we need to have that same kind of re respect and reverence towards leaders in the faith, in the church. Just because you don't respect somebody or just because you don't like somebody does not mean that you get to not respect the office and the anointing in which they are called to do by God, okay? So we need to be slow because it gets dangerous and it gets foolish and stupid when we start uh, black, when we not black, when we start speaking ill against um leaders in the body anyways you know uh one verse that i know is taken out of context a lot when it comes to uh dealing with calling people out in the body i swear you know it's like christians love <laughs> there's people that just sit around and they and they just wait for people to fall, just so that's just so they can be like, hey, another false teacher was exposed, or another false prophet. They they sit around, they build stupid YouTube channels that just literally twist everything preachers say, take stuff out of context through fancy editing, and, and make people false prophets that don't fit the bill. It says right here. And First John, it says seven ways. That, this is a uh, my Dakes Bible. If you don't have one, get one. It's my Dakes annotated annotated Bible. But in the notes here, in First John, chapter four it says, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit." Yes, we are to test. We are to to discern, test the spirits whether or not they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. It says seven ways to test false prophets. Their confession of Jesus, a false prophet. A true false prophet, not someone that you just don't like because you have a personality clash. A true false prophet is going to have an obscure confession of Jesus. Their relationship with the world. How they receive Christianity. 
their attitude towards the commandments of the Lord. Loving the brethren, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and knowledge of the Word of God. Okay? It says, those are some facts on how to test false prophets. This is another one in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, but there are those false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring to themselves swift destruction. Now you tell me how somebody, like say, uh, Jeremiah Johnson or Lance Walnow, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, or what's another one, Kim Clement, it's weird because everybody said, oh, that's a false prophet or something like that. It's weird because I didn't hear them denounce Jesus Christ. I didn't hear them change the word of God. I didn't hear them. I mean, according to this, I didn't hear them, you know, cash app. And hey, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a, a prophetic word. Here's my cash app. It's going to cost you fifty dollars for it. I didn't hear him do any of those things. Right. So that's what it says right here in the word. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom they, the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. That means that they're going to, you know, essentially, they're going to be selling their prophetic gift for money. They're in this for money. Okay. It's weird because when Jeremiah Johnson releases words, I don't see his cash app tagged at the bottom. Hey, if you want another word, if you want another word, message me. Fifty dollars a pop. I just, you know, I don't mean to rant, but I cannot stand it when people are constantly calling people false prophets and false teachers. It drives me crazy because. Christians, we're supposed to be encouraging each other. We're supposed to be each other's biggest cheerleaders. Yes, people will fall. People will miss the mark. We're not perfect. Okay? And if we do miss the mark prophetically, if we do release a word that was not entirely accurate or accurate at all, then, then we need to come forward and be like, hey, you know what? I missed it. I'm so sorry. I, I, I you know, for whatever reason, I was inaccurate, and I'm sorry. That's that's fine. That's perfectly acceptable. And, and that's that's beyond fault. That's beyond prophetic words. Anytime that we fall short, OK, doing anything, we should always apologize and make it right. That's not even got nothing to do with prophets. That's got to do with just being a believer. Anytime we fall short and offend people, even unintentionally, we should always be trying to make it right. OK, so that's a given. But we have to stop coming against prophets and leaders just because we don't agree with them or we misunderstand them or maybe we're just impatient and waiting on the word to come to pass it's like a kid on christmas and he wants the bicycle that he saw online he wants the bicycle and he opens up all his christmas presents and he doesn't see the bicycle and he gets really upset and he's sad because he was looking forward to that he told dad a hundred times that that's what he wanted that's the one thing he wanted if he wanted anything and what he doesn't know is that dad got the bicycle but it's hidden behind the christmas tree okay out of his sight he's opened up all the other presents and he was happy and grateful but he didn't get the one that he wanted yet but at the end, dad brings the bike out and the boy wipes his tears away and he sees it's his long awaited Christmas present, the one that he wanted. Why did he wait? Because dad wanted to work up that anticipation. OK, good things come to those who wait. And we're going to get to that in just a second. I just wanted to I wanted to teach a little bit on, on just prophetic words and false doctrine and false prophets and how so many people. Talk about false doctrine, false prophets, and they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. A false prophet is somebody who is tearing down the gospel, who is teaching false doctrine that's not found in the word or severely twisting the word. There might be a, a misinterpretation. We might not see eye to eye on something in scripture, but that doesn't make either of us a false teacher or a false prophet. It's just the way we're reading it is not lining up with each other. And that's okay because God can sort that stuff out. 
in due time to people that have ears to hear and eyes to see, of course, right? Because we all have to remain teachable. We all have to remain students of the word. But to call someone false just because you don't agree with them is completely nonsensical and foolish and, and, and slanderous. And in Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and be obedient, ready to do every good deed. That means in the church, too, by the way. I'm just saying. Remind them to be subject to rulers and to authorities. Paul's talking about in every realm where authority rests, which includes the church. It's not the only time that he teaches people to be subject to spiritual authorities. Okay? It says to. Uh, malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing consideration for all men. It is not gentle or peaceable to go around calling people false prophets and telling people and demanding that they apologize. That is not, you should be praying that their words come to pass. You should be encouraging. God, please let their words come to pass. I want to see Donald Trump reelected, first of all, but I want my brothers to win. We should want each other to win. Even if we don't like each other's personalities, we should still put that stupid pettiness to the side and want each other to win and rejoice in each other's victories. Not, oh, I, you know, I hope he's wrong. Well, shame on you. How childish can you be? 1 Corinthians twelve twenty eight. Here are some of the parts that God appointed for the church. God appointed for the church. Remember back to Numbers 12 when God appointed no Moses to be the leader and Miriam came against him. It didn't end well for her. She got reprimanded pretty bad for that. God has appointed these to the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, uh, and then it goes on and on. The point I'm trying to make is if you're speaking against leaders in the church, you're speaking against the ruler, not the rulers, you're speaking against the, the governor, the go I'm tripping over my words now, I drank too much coffee. You're speaking against the leadership, there we go, that the Lord himself appointed to the church to govern, build, and guide the body of Christ. Now, if you're speaking against those people, that's not good. You're speaking against the anointing of God. You're speaking against the offices that God constructed and the people that he put in them. That doesn't end well for Miriam in Numbers chapter 12. So we need to be slow to speak, and we need to be wise with our words, and we need to have a reverent fear for the Lord. And that also means for uh, respecting and having reverence for the men and women of God that he ordained and placed in the church. So speaking against prophets is stupid. It's ignorant. We just need to zip this thing up. We need to pray. Pray, pray, pray. Because the fact, see, this is what really bothers me. And I'm not even talking about the election, but I will talk about the election in this, in this matter. The fact that people would rather, there are people, there are believing Christians that would rather see these prophets apologize so that it feeds their own ego and being right about that prophet being wrong, even at the expense of the entire nation losing Donald Trump as president, losing a Bible-believing Christian who, who stands with Israel, who stands for unborn children, who stands for the church. Where were these pastors at? Where were all the leaders of faith at when these lockdowns were happening? Many of them were silent. Donald Trump has been more proactive about giving the church its rights, its constitutional rights, than most of the Christian leaders in America. And here we are, hoping that the prophets are wrong and that Biden wins so that we can be right in saying that, the, that, that they were false prophets. Are you kidding me? Kill your flesh, man. I, I mean, people drive me crazy. They would rather see a brother or sister crash and burn so that they can be right than for them to, to eat crow and see someone be victorious. That's called pride, and it doesn't end well for people in the Word who have pride problems. It doesn't end well at all.
First, uh, Second Peter one nineteen. Actually, no, I skipped one. <clears throat> Second Timothy two twenty four through twenty six. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Able to teach, patient when wronged, patient, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Okay, so even if they were wrong, even if a prophet's wrong, okay, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. So even if they're wrong, you still don't get to slander. You still don't get to throw stones. With gentleness and utmost love and respect, you reach out with a voice of correction. Hebrews 6, 13, 15. Now we're going to shift gears here. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you, and I will multiply you. And so having, having patiently waited, having patiently waited, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. People don't know how to endure. People don't know how to be patient. That's why I said at the beginning of this video, I said at the beginning of this video, as soon as the clock struck 12 on November 3rd, everybody was ready with stones in their hands to call out all the prophetic voices for all their inaccurate words, demanding apologies. Who are you? Who are you? Mr. Perfect. You know, at the end of the day, like I said, the election is still going as of this video. The election is still going, okay? There is no decisive winner or loser. I don't care who claims victory. There is no winner right now. We're going to the courts. Uh, investigations are being done. So, I, don't, I mean, I, I hope they have parades for Biden. I really do because personally, you know, God's victory is going to be so sweet. Like sweet wine, okay? His victory. So I hope the devil, I hope all the wicked people go out and they go all out with fireworks and parades, and I hope that they just parade all over the place because God's will is going to be done. And when it is finished, the wicked will fall. And we need to be praying for our enemies so that when they fall, God's will will be done in their lives. God doesn't want anybody going to hell. We need to be praying for our president. You know, there's people congratulating Joe Biden as if he's the president. He's not the president. Quit congratulating him, okay? He's not the president. We don't need to, I mean, don't even congratulate. We don't need to be congratulating either one of them right now because there's no winner yet, not yet. But even if that's the case, there's people that are congratulating Joe Biden, but they're not even praying for the current president that's at least going to be president for the next two and a half months or so, okay? We're supposed to be praying for the president and praying for the wicked, which that suits both, okay? So even when the wicked fall, we still need to be praying that God's will is done in each of their lives and that God truly saves their souls and he gets a hold of them. And he saves them wherever they fall. But we have to learn as Christians how to patiently endure. We have to learn how to be battle-hardened. And we have to learn how to be patient and waiting on the promise. Noah, it took him, what, 80 years, 100 years to build the ark? You know, he, he didn't have a microwave for that. He, had, he endured for 100 years, and he built that ark. Abraham patiently waited, and he obtained the promise. And here we are throwing a fit because we got to wait five days after election to get up. You know what? It might be a couple of weeks. And in that couple of weeks, we need to patiently endure, patiently wait. You know, the disciples had to wait 10 days for the Holy Spirit. We haven't even had to wait, what, 10 days since the election? It hasn't even been a full week yet. I don't think. The disciples had to wait 10 days for the Holy Spirit, and they didn't even know how long they were going to be waiting. Jesus just said, go and wait. He didn't tell them how long to wait. See, that's the whole thing. The Lord will never really tell us how long to wait on the promise. He wants to. That's where the testing is. That's where endurance is built. So when we're waiting, we should be praying like the disciples did. When the disciples were 
uh, waiting on the Holy Spirit, waiting on the promise, like we are waiting on the promise that the prophets spoke that, that, that we would have President Trump for two terms. Okay? The, the disciples weren't fighting. They were in one mind and one accord, and they stayed continual in prayer. Okay? So that's what we need to be doing right now. We need to be shutting up about calling people false and, and, and demanding apologies from, from prophets. We need to just be quiet with all that nonsense. Until, until it's over, it's not over yet, folks. And so until that time comes, we need to be standing in agreement in prayer. We need to be fasting. We need to be uh, encouraging, cheering, uh, cheering it on, cheering President Trump on, because he is the only candidate that lines up the most with this word, and that's all that really matters. And everybody that's voted has already voted, so it, uh, you know, it doesn't matter about votes anymore because that's already done and gone. That ship sailed. So what, however you voted, if you voted, you know, that's all, that ship has been sailed. Now we pray. Now we fast. Now we stand in agreement and we lift each other up. Not just lift the president up. We need to be lifting the prophetic voices up that are getting slammed and hammered right now by the body of Christ. And we need to be lifting them up. We need to be reaching out to them. We need to be loving on them, loving them. No greater commandment than to love one another. Love God and love your neighbor. Second Peter 1.19. Actually, 1 Peter 2.20 and staying with enduring for a moment. After Abraham patiently waited, he obtained the promise. 1 Peter 2.20, Of course, you will get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing what's wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Matthew 24.13, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The moral of this part of the story is that we need to endure these precious days and we need to be praying for our president. We need to be praying for the prophetic voices. We need to be praying for the body of Christ. We need to be praying for America. And we need to be loving each other, okay? And in that, when we patiently endure, we will be pleasing to the Lord. Now moving on to Second Peter 1.19. Because of, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote. You must pay close attention. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the, dawn, until the day dawns and, the Christ, and Christ, the morning star, shines in their hearts. And I'm going to read that through the Passion Translation. And so we have been given the prophetic word, the written message of the prophets, made more reliable and fully validated by the confirming voice of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you will continue to do well if you stay focused on it. For this prophetic message is like a piercing light shining in a gloomy place until the dawning of a new day when the morning star rises in our hearts. And you will continue to do well if you stay focused on it. Uh, the New Living Translation of Second Peter 1.19 says, And you must pay close attention to what the prophets wrote. Stop picking it apart, stop criticizing, and pay attention to what they said. Go back and read what the prophetic, what the prophetic voices said. I went back and read mine. There for a second, I thought when I released a word that I said he won by a landslide, and, and I didn't because I was getting ready to type up an apology myself. And I know, I'm all like, I was freaking out. I'm like, oh boy, I got to type up an apology now. And so I went back and, and I wrote what I said, and I said that he would, the Lord would provide Trump with an overwhelming and undeniable victory. That doesn't necessarily mean landslide victory. That can mean that if it goes to the Supreme Court, it will be a unanimous decision that Donald Trump is the president, and there will be no arguing that. So chill out with throwing stones. It says to focus on what the words are saying. It says to pay close attention. It says you will do well if you stay focused on the prophetic words. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on what the Word of God says. This is not just prophecy. This is in life. You will do well if you stay focused on the Word of God. Amen? 2 Thessalonians 5, 11 through 15. Therefore, encourage one another, build up one another, just as you are doing, so that no one repays another with evil. 
but always seek after which is good for one another and for all people. Encourage and build up. Encourage and build up. Encourage and build up. That's what we need to be doing right now. Not criticizing, not looking for fault, not not pointing out planks, or not pointing out a speck in a brother's eye while not paying attention to the plank in our own. We need to be encouraging each other, cheering each other on, and building each other up. Because, you know, it's crazy right now. Everybody's had a long year, and we just need to show some love to each other because we all are feeling stressed out in different ways. And we just need to show love to one another and encourage one another and build each other up and be quick to forgive. Jesus said 70 times 7, be quick to forgive. Hebrews uh, 3, 12 through 13, take care, brethren, that there may not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now, uh, I like the New Living Trans version of that better. It says, be careful then, dear brothers, uh, Hebrews three twelve. be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. And, you know, like I said, there's been a lot of skepticism about the words spoken. People are skeptic about the prophet, prophetic words and whatnot. And I will say this. Thomas was infamous. Thomas, the, the, the apostle Thomas, the disciple Thomas, he was infamous for his doubt. He had a doubt problem. And he said, I will not believe that Jesus was resurrected until I can put my hand in his wounds. It wasn't enough. To hear that he was resurrected, Thomas had to put his hands in the wounds. We have a lot of Thomases out there right now that don't believe that Trump is winning this election. And they're saying, I'm not going to believe anything until I see it. Listen, you have to get your heart right. You have to get your heart in tune with the word. Okay. And I'm not just talking about Trump here. I'm talking about life. You have to get your heart right. That's an unbelieving heart. It says, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, like Thomas's was in that moment, turning away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So we, we have to be encouraging one another. Amen. Having said that, you know, in closing, I, I just want to encourage you. Stay positive. Don't don't listen to the news. And, but if you are going to watch the news, watch Newsmax. Newsmax is the bomb. I got I, I love Newsmax. They, they are what, you know, Fox used to be, maybe even better. But, you know, it's good to be uh, skeptical to a certain degree. You know, don't don't be gullible. But don't understand that there is a difference between skepticism and a spirit of discernment. They're not the same thing. Don't confuse them. A spirit of discernment is a gift from the Lord. Skepticism is flesh. Okay? So while we shouldn't be gullible, and we should test the spirits, of course, we also need to understand if there's 100 prophets, 100 trusted prophets and prophetic voices, in the church, not not mentioning all the local bodies, not mentioning regional voices. I'm talking about national uh, people that are nationally known. Okay, if there's not if there's a hundred of them saying the same thing, okay, then it's probably an indication that they're not lying. Okay, unless a devil deceived all these people. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of impossibilities. I'm saying it's highly unlikely. I'm saying we need to look closer at the bigger picture of what God's doing right now. Like I said earlier, if, ha if Trump had won by a landslide, there would have been no need for an investigation. There would have been no reason to look. I believe that, go that God is using this situation right now to take people and investigate broken wickedness in our government. And I believe that's what he's doing. That's what I believe. And another thing I believe he's doing, I believe he's doing a work in the president's heart right now. I believe it's possible that had Trump won by a landslide, by an initial, he may still, like once they count the votes, he may still win by a landslide, folks. The votes, ha the votes have to be recounted. So he may still very well win by a unanimous landslide. That's not out of the question right now. But until that happens, what I think is that God 
is doing a work in the president's heart, okay? Because had Trump initially won by a landslide, he may have become lifted up and his pride may have went through the roof. And to keep Donald Trump humble, the Lord has to do this to him and, and, and take him through a pruning. And, 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 you know, maybe Trump has been on one knee the first four years. Maybe when, 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 Don, when Donald Trump first got into office, God finally got him down to one knee. But maybe this is going to bring him down to both knees before the Lord and humble him, humble what's left of him, and do such a work in him, okay? I'm telling you right now, God is doing a lot of stuff with a lot of people. He's testing all of our hearts. He's exposing all of our hearts, all the doubt, all the fear. This year has been a very exposing year in the church right now, very. And I really feel like this is going to continue to bring humility into the president's life. And, and watch. Watch his demeanor continue to change going forward. Watch him continue to speak softer, continue to hold his tongue more, continue to refrain from being a blowhorn, okay? Watch and see what happens. God bless you, and you have a wonderful day.